Hi, Jane here. Thanks for joining me. I'm a huge fan of empowering you, as are the speakers in our Go Big series. Have you stopped to think recently what you really want in your life? Do you feel like you were meant for more as I had for so many years? What's the big goal that you want to achieve this coming year or a fear that you finally want to get over? If you're ready to re-envision your future and launch your big idea, maybe spread your influence or get over a fear finally, then I invite you to join me and some of our speakers. We want to help you empower your mindset, build your vision and own your dream. Stop needing to be right and let's do this now, together. Go to janeapplegath.com, click on Go Big Sign Up, and I will see you there. Sending you much love and success. Have an incredibly epic day. Hope to see you soon. Hi everyone, I'm Jane Applegath. Welcome to the Epic Vision Zone, where some of the world's most successful self-made women and men share their multi-million dollar ideas, their high performance habits, visionary mindsets, and resources so you can hit the go button on your epic life. Think about this. If you are struggling or unhappy in any aspect of your life, chances are you made a choice that wasn't tuned into your conscience. At this moment in time, given the disruption of a global pandemic and so much more, our special guest today says it is our conscience that can turn things around for us one heart and one mind at a time. Leonard Perlmutter is the author of a brilliant new book titled Your Conscience, The Key to Unlock Limitless Wisdom and Creativity and Solve All of Life's Challenges. Readers will discover how to listen for the innate universal wisdom that lies within all of us and how to curb our tendency to ignore and overrule it. One of the Western world's most renowned meditation pioneers, Leonard Perlmutter adapts proven tools drawn from 5,000 year old yoga science playbook and shows us how to tap into and live by our conscience. As founder of the revered American Meditation Institute, Leonard's renowned courses are approved and accredited by the American Medical Association and Nurses Association. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Heart and Science of Yoga, and the originator of the National Conscious Month, plus serves as the author and editor of Transformation, the Journal of Meditation as Mind-Body Medicine. Over the past 25 years, Leonard has served on the faculties of the New York England Institute of Ayurveda Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts, and the International Himalayan Yoga Teachers Association in Calgary, Canada. Plus, he has presented workshops on meditation and yoga science at prestigious cancer centers, US military, medical and university facilities across the nation. Welcome, Leonard. Thank you so much for joining us here today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, Jane. My pleasure. I am so excited to get started. As I was talking briefly with Leonard prior to our interview, I have been reading his book with avid interest and curiosity, and we'll just dive right in. My first question today, Leonard, is exactly what is the conscience? The conscience is one of four major functions of the mind. It's unique because only the conscience can discriminate, determine, judge, and decide what's to be done and what's not to be done. And when I, when I heard that for the first time and I realized the, the power of it, it means that every single decision you and I have ever made or ever will make has been and will be authored by the conscience because the conscience is the only function of the mind that can make a decision. The other three functions of the mind are really counselors. They are advisors. 
but they have no power to make a final decision. Wow. That is so powerful. Isn't it? It is. Oh my gosh. We really need to learn more about it. Well, I'm yeah. so glad you're here. So why is it then, is it so hard to follow its advice? It's hard to uh, follow its advice because, well, it's very much analogous uh, to the same challenge that engineers have. There's a stereotypical problem that engineers deal with all the time. It's called the signal and the noise. So engineers hear a signal, but it is only being broadcast at a certain decibel level, and it's fairly low, sort of quiet, like the conscience. And blotting out that signal is the noise, which is analogous to the other three functions of the mind, namely the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind. Now, the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind which are the other three functions, they only have limited perspectives. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, maybe quite a, a lot, they're, they're faulty. <laughs> and yet, they are often wrong, but never in doubt. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for us to follow the conscience in real time because there's too much noise. There's too much anarchy going on in the mind and nobody is dealing with it. No, no one of us has been taught how to rectify the situation. So in such cases, Jane, the conscience is still going to make the decision, but it will not be able to use its full capacity so instead, it simply gives a rubber stamp to the loudest, squeakiest voice. And that would be coming from either the ego, senses, or unconscious mind, or a combination of the three. Oh my gosh, it's a wonder we don't walk around in circles. <laughs> Seriously. Well, we do walk around in circles. Well, we do walk around in circles. There's a there's a marvelous little story about a man who was gaining weight, and he desired to lose some of that weight. So he was talking heart to heart with a very close friend of his, explaining that he had been gaining quite a bit of weight. And so the friend said, "Well, tell me more." He said, "Well, I I go out of my way to walk to work so that I can." lose more weight. And so what happens is, as I approach the local bakery store across the street from my office, I can smell the delicious baked goods, the fresh baked goods. And then I go unconscious. And the next time I wake up, I'm walking across the street to the office with a little brown bag in my hand. <laughs> you have any advice for me? Oh and so the friend said to him, why don't you leave your wallet at home? <laughs> and, and the fellow said, are you suggesting that I steal the donuts? <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> oh my Lord, his senses are overpowering <laughs> everything. <laughs> It's, 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 it's funny, but there's a tear coming down our cheek because right, it's us. Right. It's us it's we're us. talking about. Oh, my gosh. Oh, but yes, I love it. I love stories. And what a great analogy. Oh, my Lord. Yes. Steal, steal the goods. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> then you at least your, your senses will be happy, if nothing else. Right. Oh, my gosh. Right. That was fabulous, Leonard. Oh, my gosh. I love it. So where does then if that's the case, because I hear these three loud voices that are overpowering the sensible one, where does the conscience get its wisdom? Well, when the other three functions of the mind can be quieted, 
-hmm. and can relax and just listen. The conscience acts as a mirror that can reflect perfect wisdom from the super conscious portion of the mind at the center of consciousness. Mm -hmm. The conscience can reflect perfect wisdom 24 seven from the super conscious portion of the mind. What do you mean by super conscious portion of the mind? We never learned anything like that in school. Well, the super conscious mind is beyond the conscious mind. It is beyond the unconscious mind. And it's not just poetry or metaphor. It's the same portion of the mind where Albert Einstein saw mathematical equations. And it's the same portion of the mind where Paul McCartney hears beautiful melodies. Doesn't mean that we're gonna become a songwriter. Doesn't mean that we're gonna become a physicist or a mathematician. What it does mean is that if we can quiet the other functions of the mind that we can discuss in a moment and let the conscience be our guide, it will have the capacity to reflect super conscious wisdom directly into our conscious mind. And once it's in our conscious mind, we can do something with it. Wow. So then let's explore those four functions of the mind. Yes. So the four functions of the mind are Oh, thank you. That's very nice that, uh, that you displayed that. First is the ego. Now, the ego is very interesting because the ego is hardwired to the reptilian brain. What does that mean? It means, like the reptilian brain, the ego is always frightened. Frightened about what? Frightened about annihilation. So everything the ego does is motivated by self-preservation. Now sometimes that works out fine, especially if there's a saber-toothed tiger around the corner. But a lot of times the threat, the danger, is simply imagined. And the ego, with its limited perspective, doesn't know the difference. So the ego is very attached, I would say addicted, to things that are pleasant and attractive. And the ego defines these things as good. And the ego wants to reprise them. The ego also has a disdain for anything that is unpleasant, which the ego defines as bad and wants us to eliminate it from our life. Unfortunately, and actually fortunately as well, we have personal experience in this regard. We already know from our limited experience that that which is pleasant is not always good for us. And that which is unpleasant isn't always bad for us. So if I get locked in to just reprising the pleasant, what the ego says is good, without discriminating, then I'm gonna experience pain. And not only mental pain and mental inflexibility, but physical inflexibility and physical pain, because the body is a projection of the mind. So that's the ego always defining things as good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant. That's the first function. Now the ego with that limited perspective is often wrong, but never in doubt, never in doubt. Now the senses are very interesting. Now we're talking about the organs of sense, the eyes, the nostrils, the mouth, the ears, the hands, the feet. And our mind extrudes our creative energy through these senses. 
to go out into the material world to look, to smell, to taste, to listen to, and to touch, and to bring back information about the world and what is likely to make me happy, what is likely to make me secure, what is likely to make me healthy. Mm -hmm. And it's somewhat analogous to squeezing a tube of toothpaste. When we squeeze a tube of toothpaste, the toothpaste comes out quite easily. But if we decided that we need to put the toothpaste back in the tube, that would virtually be an impossible chore. Well, if the truth be told, the mind is addicted to squeezing out, not toothpaste, but our creative energy through our eyes and our nostril and our mouth and our ears and our hands and feet. And the truth is we waste a tremendous amount of our creative energy chasing rainbows that are never fulfilling. So the senses, just like the ego, only has a limited perspective, often wrong, but never in doubt. But the senses only see the front, never the back, never the back. So for example, if you're walking down the street and you see across the street, there's a little bar and grill that has a very large neon sign. I think it's a red sign and it's blinking, blinking, blinking on and off, on and off. And what does the sign say? Free beer, free beer, free beer. That's what the senses go for, the front, the appearance. They avoid even thinking about the backside. And so we cross the street to get our free beer. And as we go inside the bar and grill, we look up at the red sign and right underneath it is a little, small, little sign, handwritten. And what does it say? Tomorrow. Yes, free beer, free beer, free beer. But it's tomorrow. Even if you come tomorrow, the free beer will be served tomorrow. <laughs> so it's never really what we had hoped it for, for it. So that's the senses, the second function. And the third function is the unconscious. This is the repository of everything that we deem essential to our self-preservation. Yeah. And that means our memories as well as our imagination. And again, the unconscious only has a limited perspective. So we have the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind. And these are counselors. They can only make suggestions. And they have very limited, often faulty perspectives. But they're always certain that they're correct. <laughs> they're like the wow. color commentators on TV. We've seen yeah. them. Often wrong, but never in doubt. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Fascinating. Boy, this is so much food for thought. Um, so that being the case with all of these players, where does this framework come from? Well, it's a 6,000 year old tradition of women and men, just like you and me, who felt pain in their lives and dissatisfaction with the way things were going. And they began, instead of continuously going outside of themselves, they began to counsel within. And they began to parent and train the ego, senses, and unconscious mind just for the sake of a scientific experiment to trust the conscience with small, seemingly insignificant no-brainer of, of a, an experiment. 
And the more that they experimented, the better they felt physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And the more that we, we today can parent and train our ego, senses, and unconscious mind to experiment, just experiment. I'm not asking anybody to give up being a doubting Thomas. I myself am a doubting Thomas. Any good scientist is a doubting Thomas. But a scientist, by definition, is willing to do experiments. Our job is to turn our entire mind, body, sense complex into a laboratory for experimenting. Experimenting with the truth, the super conscious wisdom that's reflected by the conscience. And just see what happens. Just see what happens. My experience is I have felt better physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And I continued that process of parenting my ego senses and unconscious mind. That led me to teach other people. And ultimately during COVID, when we were in quarantine, I asked myself, how may I be of service in this situation when, when students are no longer coming? What can I give them to help them get through this very challenging period of time? Medically, politically, socially. And I thought to myself in the answer that I came up with, what I will give them is your conscience. Wow, that's brilliant. And when you were telling your story of the four quadrants of the mind, it reminded mm -hmm. me of herding kittens <laughs> in a yes. sense. Yes, that, that's because right. Because they wander everywhere. And yes. Oh, fascinating. Let's continue on. Um, now, we're into the law of karma. And why okay. are thoughts so important to this? Thoughts are our most powerful resource. Thoughts are our most powerful resource. Thoughts lead to action. So I can't raise my hand without first entertaining a thought. The mind moves first, the body follows. So thoughts lead to action. Those actions can be mental, they can be verbal, and they can be physical. However, regardless of what kind of action it is that I take, there is always a consequence that develops that can lead me in one direction or another. Now, we all already know the direction we want to go in. We do want to be happy. We want to be healthy. We want to be secure, no matter how we define that. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how are we going to get from point A to point B? Do we have a business plan? For life? Do we have a philosophy of life? No. Nobody has ever taught us that. Nobody has ever taught us about the mind and the power of the mind and how to coordinate the functions of the mind so that the conscience can guide us in ways that we could never have imagined inside this matrix. So the law of karma, which later became Newton's third law of motion, for every action, there's an equal reaction. We learned that in grade school science, and it's true. So we need to pay attention to our thoughts because they are so powerful. They're packed with energy that we need to fulfill the purpose of our life without pain. Yes. Absolutely. And the thoughts too, 
always create an action which, which could mean they releasing chemicals into your body, you know, whether good or bad. Um, and that of course leads you down to another pathway. So fascinating because we all have, a, many of us have a different interpretation of the law of karma, which is more commercialized that you, you know, karma is coming back at you, but this is the core meaning of karma which you yes. say a thought leads to an action that leads to a consequence. Yes, Correct. absolutely. So you say that there are only two kinds of thoughts. Can you describe them? I can. And to help us remember these two kinds of thoughts, they rhyme, which is always handy. So these two thoughts are known as Preya and Shreya. Preya and Shreya. It's kind of neat. So Preya is pleasant, attractive, comfortable, and familiar. It's some form of ego or sense gratification that conflicts with our inner wisdom. It conflicts with the superconscious wisdom reflected by the conscience. Mm -hmm. And an example might be fear, worry, a second jelly donut. <laughs> and generally speaking, initially, it's pleasant, but it always leaves in its wake pain. That's the Freya. It's the ground upon which the ego stands. Hmm. That's Freya. The Shreya is not so comfortable, not so familiar, not so attractive, not so pleasant initially. But it will always, always, always lead us for our highest and greatest good. That might be broccoli. Okay. That might be compassion and forgiveness. And the key to successful living is to let the conscience guide us and tell us which thoughts are prayer to be sacrificed and transformed from a contractive and debilitating poisonous force into an expansive healing energy, an increase in our willpower, and an increase in our creative capacity. So fear and anger and selfish desires themselves are not bad. They're just energy. They're forms of energy, huge amounts of energy. But if we act on them in real time in their contracted state, when I am subject to fear or anger or selfish desire, that's only going to poison my entire physiology as well as my mind and I will suffer. Hmm. But if I can base my outer action on the inner wisdom, and this is what we call the bridge of yoga, basing outer action on inner wisdom, the inner wisdom reflected by the conscience, then that's always going to lead me for my highest and greatest good and will transform the contractive power of that prayer that can poison me and debilitate my body and mind. It can transform it into an expansive and creative force that can bring us healing energy, willpower, and creativity. We have, a, we have an issue, though, because we have been gifted by the culture with a negative attitude toward the word sacrifice. When I say that we're to sacrifice 
the prayer, people, oh, they shudder. Oh, because they equate sacrifice with denial of things that are pleasant. But nothing could be farther from the truth. That's not what it is. It's about sacrificing poison so that I can receive something that is going to be loving and nurturing to me, to help me fulfill the purpose of my life without the pain. Mm -hmm. Right. So during the yeah. day, as we examine our thoughts, we let the conscience be our guide. Serving the Shreya in thought, word, and deed, and sacrificing, sacrificing the prayer so that it can be transformed into strategic reserves of energy, willpower, and creativity that will be deposited in the subtle world with my name on it. Hmm. So it's sort of like banking. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I can I can make deposits if I have if I have a lot of fear in my life, and I have a lot of anger and a lot of greed. It only means one thing to me. I'm a rich person. It's like having a gold mine in my backyard or an oil deposit found and discovered in my backyard. But in order to make use of it, I have to get it out of the ground. And I have to send it to some kind of refining capacity. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do when we sacrifice. <clears throat> you know, the word sacrifice, it comes from the Latin. And then later, the Italian, sacrifaci, make it sacred, make it sacred. This is sacred energy. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. This is sacred energy coming. Right. And right. I need to respect it, honor it, and sacrifice it so that it can be transformed into something that is usable. Very interesting. The word that really hit me there to put it in because people have such a negative connotation with sacrifice is refine. That was brilliant because we want to sacrifice but refine it almost like an alchemist changing it it's not it's it. not almost, it's not almost it's that's it exactly what it is that's that's the okay. process okay so so just for example if right. i gave you 20 gallons of crude oil from mm -hmm. saudi arabia and put it into your tank in your automobile or your truck you'd be very upset because crude oil does not work in a combustion engine and it would wreck no. your engine. But if I took that crude oil from Saudi Arabia and I sent it to say uh, New Jersey or Texas or California to a refinery to refine it into gasoline, then you'd be very happy. Yes. And fear, yeah. anger and selfish desire, greed, is the same thing, only a different form of energy. And when you refine it, it becomes a very powerful form of energy. Whereas when you That's unrefined, right. it becomes a damaging form of energy. Yes. That's right. Absolutely. Oh, so powerful. Well, does the conscience really always know the difference? If it is allowed a space between stimulus and response, if it is allowed the quietude and equanimity in the space between two thoughts, between stimulus and response, yes, it, then it can reflect wisdom from the center of consciousness. The problem is, we have not used the conscience that much. So like any mirror that is not used, dust and debris land on its mm -hmm. surface and retard its reflective capacity. That means that we need to practice. And every time we sacrifice the prayer and serve the Shreya, 
It's like getting the glass cleaner out and spritzing the mirror and cleaning it, cleaning it, cleaning it, so that more and more the conscience can reflect 24-7 whatever is needed to make the journey rewarding. Practice, yes, absolutely. So insightful. So what kinds of problems can be solved by relying on the conscience? Like I, I often ask um, Leonard, you know, in, in the coaching world, can we gain clarity on purpose? Can we tap into what we think or believe is our destiny? Can we align with those who are seeking us? As Rumi says, who you seek is seeking you. What kinds of problems can be solved by relying or tapping into the conscience? <clears throat> I always suggest that the first problem to tackle is the word problem. <laughs> okay. Yes, is the word problem. Like the word that we just talked about, sacrifice, mm -hmm. vocabulary defined by the culture is very triggering and oppressive. It can be. So yes. just for a moment, Jane, bring the word problem into the cave of the heart. Mm -hmm. If you're comfortable, close your eyes, but just repeat problem, problem, problem. I have a problem. And feel the weight of that word. Okay, now just stay there, if you will and switch the word to situation, situation, situation. I have a situation. And compare the weight of the word situation to problem and tell me what you experienced. Oh, problem was just heavy. It just, every time you repeated it, I just felt heavier and heavier. And situation was like, okay, I can deal with that. Um, <laughs> how do I, let's work on a, so, a solution. It was right. completely different. There was no heaviness at all. It was uh, almost like intellectual, like, okay, it's a situation. That's not a big deal. Right. So that's wow. the first problem that we want to uh, deal with. Get rid of the word problem from our vocabulary mm -hmm. and I love substitute it. situation. We'll be much more creative because that word problem, it just locks us down. Mm -hmm. yep. And it locks down all of our creative capability of both receiving creativity and giving and serving creativity. When I asked you the question, I said, what kinds of problems can be solved by relying on the conscience? So situations, what kinds of situations can be solved by relying on the conscience? If a situation comes to me, I am definitely capable of dealing with it. I am definitely uh, able to access some form of inner wisdom to share with a person, with uh, 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 some, some form of organization, whatever the relationship is, I will have access to some inner wisdom that I can share that will advance and benefit the individual or the collective whole. Right, absolutely. I Otherwise, see it wouldn't be coming to me. It would be coming, the thought would be coming to someone else. Yes. So my question here, and maybe you answered it, it says, can you give us an easy example of an experiment we can try? Was that sure. sort of the one that you, you okay. Well, that, that is one, but I'd be happy to give you others. Okay. Because, because we need, when we first start out, remember in, in yoga science, 
The highest principle is ahimsa, non-injury, non-harming. So we don't want to take on too much too soon. If we never lifted weights before to build muscles, we don't want to start lifting 200 pounds. We want some, you know, one or two pounds, three or four, and then slowly, slowly we can build up. So right. we want to start with what's easy. And if it's, if it's easy, it's going to be easy for the ego, senses, and unconscious mind to have a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. Here's what I mean. <clears throat> Say we just finished dinner. And the question comes up, are we going to brush our teeth? Mm -hmm. So in that case, I make an appointment with the ego, senses, unconscious mind, and the conscience to meet me at the kitchen table. And we all go over to the kitchen table together, seated around the kitchen table, all five of us the four functions of the mind and me. So I play the role of the parent. Okay, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the parent here. And so I say to the ego, dear ego, the question before us is, are we going to brush our teeth after dinner? What do you say? To me, it's unpleasant. I don't like it. I think it's bad. I'm against it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your limited perspective. That's very kind. Thank you. Senses? What do you say? Well, to be very honest, I would prefer to have a slice, another slice of apple pie. It was good the first time during dinner, and I'm sure the second slice could be even better. So I vote for more apple pie. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, an unconscious mind. What do you say? I'm with the other two. So now we, we, have, we have these three amigos. They're in lockstep. Right? They, they don't want to. They don't want to. Okay, now I'm going to ask all three of you, now that you have shared your advice, to remain quiet and listen as I ask the conscience to reflect wisdom from the superconscious mind and share it with us. Would you do that for us, please, conscience? Sure, says the conscience. And the conscience says something to the effect, you know, and I know that you know, this life of ours is not a sprint. It's more like a marathon. And for this marathon that we call life, we need healthy teeth. We need healthy gums. We need healthy and a strong immune system. And brushing our teeth for two minutes, it's a very small investment and it will help. So for the sake of an experiment, a rather easy experiment, let's all leave the kitchen table go into the bathroom, brush our teeth, and then come back and see how we all feel. So we all march into the bathroom, we brush the teeth, we come back to the kitchen table, and the parent, me, says, Ego, what did you think of that? Oh, it wasn't as bad as I was worried about. It was, it was sort of cool, sort of cool. Okay, thank you. Senses, what do you say? Gosh, I never experienced this before, but when the tongue glides over the teeth, there's no moss, no moss on my teeth. I like that, 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 that was very cool. Thank you. And unconscious, wasn't so bad, wasn't so bad. Maybe that could be a habit, wasn't so bad. Oh. And so, what have we just done? We have provided the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind with, with a pleasant experience. And because it was relatively easy and re relatively pleasant, they now trust their parent more than they did before the experiment. 
So I'm gaining their trust just a little bit. That's all I'm asking for, just a little foothold. And also something else, which is very important. The ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind now know through personal experience that death does not mean annihilation. Death, such as death of a habit, means change and growth, mm. not annihilation. So that speaks especially that speaks especially to the ego, which is hardwired to the reptilian brain, which is all about self-preservation. Because they experienced a change, they were not obliterated, but they grew from it, and their limited ex their limited perspective grew ever so slightly. Leonard, that is amazing. We need to teach children this. I mean, and, oh and adults. Gosh. Oh, well, of Everybody. course, adults. <laughs> Everybody. But can, we, can and you we have imagine? to get it into the schools. We got to get yes. into the schools. Because all the schools do, and, 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 you know, they're good at it. They teach us to memorize and recite. Oh. But, but, but that doesn't uh, help us deal with this powerful uh, mind that is acting as an adversary rather than as an ally. Right. Yes. How to make it your ally. I, that was such, I'm so glad I asked that follow up to share another example because that was so eye opening. And it actually made me smile too because my husband often says, Who are you talking to? And I said, Me, myself, and I. <laughs> so, but unbeknownst to me, it's probably the ego, the senses, and the unconscious mind. I just call them me, well, myself, and I. <laughs> well, we all, we all had that intuition, even as kids, that. Yes. There are different voices in, in our mind. Absolutely. Yeah. And they sometimes call us crazy you know, because we're talking to them. But I love that. That is so eye opening. Oh, my gosh. Because they're always talking about moving outside your comfort zone. But they don't yes. explain the back end of it, which is I do understand the reptilian brain that wants to protect us. And it's, you know, rooted in not changing us or not exploring because that could be dangerous and fearful but this explains why and this explains how a baby steps really help us grow because sometimes we that's try right. to take the leap and it's too big and then that that's right sort of it actually does the reverse because we had such that's a fearful right. experience we we you know it's like getting back on the horse kind of thing brilliant i love it thank you so much for that so Given all of this and all the chatter that's going on within our minds, isn't it exhausting to rely on the conscious minds at all times? Well, I remember when I was 16 years of age and I learned to uh, drive an automobile. And it was exhausting to learn how, how to drive a car, how, to, how much to turn the wheel to the left, how much to turn the wheel to the right, how to uh, uh, press depress the uh, the gasoline so that the automobile was not jerking along and it could smoothly accelerate and 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 uh hit the brake in in a, a way so that it could slowly slowly come to a a, a standstill and also i i was faced with the the challenge of parallel parking oh my god how am i ever going to do that I still but can't now, do it. <laughs> but now we have a global skill, right? So mm -hmm. when we start to drive, there's just driving. We don't have yeah. to be so uh, concentrated on each individual component. So right. once we begin this experimentation process, it just becomes a way of being. And it's not onerous, in part because you feel better. 
there's a, an immediate payoff, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. It's a joy. Yes. And you know that you're benefiting the whole world. Yes. It's because, practice. That's right. It's just practice. It's just practice. It's just practice. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You said we're benefiting the whole world because? Yes. Yes, because every relationship is with ourselves. Mm -hmm. I know that my brain and senses see two. I see your body. I see my body. I know you have a mind, which is different from my mind. I know that your habit patterns are different from my habit patterns. But your body and my body and your mind and my mind and your habits and my habits are all subject to change. Yes. So that's not you and it's not me. But within you and within me lies, a, lies consciousness, eternal consciousness, wisdom and bliss, sat, chit, anand. And that means that you and I are one. Mm. So oh, every relation so every relationship is with ourselves. So if I think, speak, or act in an injurious way toward you, because my eyes and my mind see something separate. Somewhere in space and time, that injury and that pain will come to me because you are me. And if I give selflessly of myself to you, somewhere in space and time, some benefit will accrue to me because I am you. Fascinating. So meaningful. So yeah. meaningful. And practical. So Practical, oh, yeah. practical. Yes. And, do, and doable. Yes, absolutely doable, for sure. So why should people listen to what you are saying? You may have just answered that question. Because they shouldn't. Okay. they shouldn't. <laughs> they should not. Okay. They should not. They should never listen. And well, they shouldn't, they can listen, but they should not believe me. I don't want anybody to believe me, right? Because anything that I say as a doubting Thomas, you should take with a grain of salt and put on your doubting Thomas hat. You should question it. But I will say, even though I don't want you to believe anything that I say or write, if you're interested, I will encourage you every day to experiment for yourself to find the truth for yourself i can help you with that if you're willing to experiment because that's the only way that you will become self-reliant that mm -hmm. is the only way that you will be responsible you will have the ability to respond in every situation creatively lovingly selflessly so don't believe me, test it. Yes. Turn your entire mind body sense complex into a laboratory. Experiment, become curious. That's yes. right. Absolutely. So how does meditation then fit into all of this? I have a feeling I know because uh, some of the studies I've done, but how does it fit into all of this? Well, first of all, it, it provides us tools and skill set. So in meditation, we learn how to focus the mind automatically at one object. One pointed attention leads us to genius and creativity. One pointed mm -hmm. attention, not multitasking which is impossible and the only way to provide the illusion that we can multitask which we cannot 
adrenaline has to be surging through the entire physiology, depressing the immune system and depressing our minds. Yeah. Really? So one pointed attention. And with one pointed attention, with that skill, we can create a space between stimulus and response. We become detached from the stimulus, detached from it. And what does that space between stimulus and response provide us? Why, freedom to redirect our attention in real time to the conscience, which can discriminate and reflect superconscious wisdom. So meditation provides us the skill of one-pointed attention, detachment, a space between stimulus and response, and because that space provides us the freedom to seek the counsel of the conscience, we also receive the skill of discrimination and wisdom. Mm -hmm because we counsel with the conscience within. And last but not least is the muscles of willpower are enhanced. They grow these muscles of willpower because slowly, slowly, slowly through the experiment process, we do what's to be done and we don't do what's not to be done. Yes, meditation. It yes. quiets the chatter, correct? Yes. Yeah, correct. the static, as I call it. The static. Yes. yes. I sure. often said when I was taking yoga, I said that we're space makers. And that just came to that's me, true. not knowing this knowledge. But that's how I always felt because it just made me feel more open when I did my practice. So that's very interesting. Yes, yeah, space maker. That's what well, I just called us space makers. So all this knowledge that I'm presenting and that others present, it's all inside of you. That's why mm -hmm. you said about the space, because intuitively you know it all. Yes, we all do. And as we experiment, as we experiment, as we experiment, the whole process is not learning new material. It is a remembering process, a remembering process. I love that. I love that. A remembering process. Yes. That, that's really, I love that. That is so, um, I've never heard that before. That is really eye-opening, really eye-opening. There's, so, there's, there's a lovely uh, little story from the Sufi tradition, tradition the uh, mystical uh, uh, arm of Islam and Sufis, believe that when the newborn baby cries, what's going on in the consciousness of the baby is something like, oh my gosh, I have forgotten. Oh, oh no, not that young. <laughs> That's not good. Well, That's but, interesting. But, but, yeah, sure. But that's where, that's where, I mean, we bring in stuff. We bring in a lot of habit patterns from previous mm -hmm. incarnations. Although people don't have to uh, believe in that. But just the birth experience uh, where uh, even though our eyes cannot see, uh, the light is relatively blinding. The smells are strange. We can't figure out what it is. The tastes are all very new and novel. And, and the sounds are much louder and cacophonous than mama's heart beating or the gurgling of her tummy or the little uh, uh, song that she sings to me as she rubs her belly. Mm -hmm. 
yes. and so the the and 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 you know the baby come uh, is born without clothes so you know it's it's chilly chilly <laughs> Okay, I could see that then. All of those things, okay. yeah, no wonder it's crying. <laughs> I would be so, too. <laughs> so, so, so what to do, what to do? And, and so there's dis-ease in the baby's mind until right. it begins to nurse at mama's breast. And all of its mental energy goes down to the nipple, to that one point, to the exclusion of the senses of the sight and the smell and the taste and the hearing and the touch. And in that meditation on mama's breast, the baby, you and I, make our first ignorant conclusion. I am a separate entity. Mama is a separate entity. And certain objects and relationships in this world wherever I am now, have the capacity to make me happy and eliminate my pain. Oh. Well, that sounds like a big issue, a situation to tackle, Leonard. <laughs> that one seems really big. <laughs> well, it's See just one, said, it's just one, one experience after the other, one okay. experiment after the other. Yeah, it's true. It's true. But I, do you see how I use the word situation instead of problem? That's I'm good. All, That's good. already learning. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. I'm never going to use the word problem again, ever. If I hear someone yeah. use it, I'm going to say, do the exact same thing you did. Now I want you to close That's your right. eyes and repeat it and tell me how you feel. Yes, That's absolutely. Right. Oh my gosh, that's brilliant, brilliant. So how can people learn more about your teachings, Leonard? Because this is so, so vital for people to learn. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, we have two websites. The first is for the book, Your Conscience. And the website is simply yourconscience.org, yourconscience.org. Okay. And then, I teach from the American Meditation Institute and uh, we have classes. And so we invite people to look at our website, which is AmericanMeditation.org, AmericanMeditation.org. Beautiful. And we will have all of Leonard's information, the book, his website, all the other links, um, social media on, within our pages under his bio. So you will be sure to check those and find them there. And I have one last question for you, Leonard, since we are here on the epic vision zone. If your life were an epic story, what would the title be? learning how to be an instrument of the truth. Beautiful. I love it. So thank you again. I can't thank you enough. I have learned so much and this will be so valuable to everyone. I will encourage everyone to listen and please, the book is fabulous. I am reading it right now. I have highlighted almost every page. So you can tell, and it really is food for thought because I, I was telling Leonard earlier, I keep going back and rereading portions of it because there is so much vital information that we all need to learn. And be sure once again to check out Leonard's new book and the American Medical Institute online video classes. He has a free weekly guided meditation and satsang and Transformation Magazine and so much more. We'll have all that information once again in his bio. And you be sure to follow me on Instagram at Jane Applegath and check out how you can become an epic entrepreneur at janeapplegath.com. This is the Epic Vision Zone, transforming your dreams into epic success. <laughs>